The last uh, few weeks we've been going through a sermon series called The Three Simple Rules, and uh, I've been handing out, I'd like the ushers to come forward if I could at this time, I've been handing out these, uh, these uh, stickers, these Klingon stickers, static cling stickers that you can put in your car or on your mirror that kind of remind us of the, th- if you, if you don't, didn't get one, would you raise your hand right now? If you didn't get one, yeah, there you go. Uh, you, can, you can put it on your mirror. I, I put mine on my car, my car windshield, like off to the side, where it can remind us of the three simple rules of early, early Methodists. John Wesley created these rules, and uh, a book came out a little bit later by a bishop, a uh, lot, lot bit later after John Wesley, in 2007 by Bishop Reuben Job, uh, called The Simple Rules. So he kind of simplified them for today's Methodists because we're a little bit slower, and uh, he, 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 the, so the three rules are kind of how they are originally pr- presented here on this, uh, this static cling uh, sticker here. But also, Bishop Job summarized them in this way. He said, uh, do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. Or as Wesley said, do no harm by avoiding evil of every kind, do all the good you can, and pursue the spiritual disciplines that help you grow in love for God. Or as Wesley said, attend to the ordinances of grace. So we'll be, we'll be talking about that next week. But this week we're talking about do all the good you can. Do all the good you can. Can we go to the next slide there, Don? So uh, in, in Bishop Job's book it says do good. But the original command of Wesley was to do all the good you can. And I was talking with, uh, with Art Keith. You know Pastor Art Keith, Barb's husband. And he said... Fred, in this series, I, I said, can you, can you give me some advice? What would you say about the next, the next thing I'm going to preach on, uh, do good? And he said, I would emphasize, do all the good you can, specifically the all part, because it speaks to an orientation to life that is always looking for chances to be positive, difference-making, grace-filled disciples of Jesus. We look for every opportunity to breathe life into other people. You guys... You guys might have heard this. Let me, let me see if you've heard it. God is good. So you do, some of you do know. So let's try it again. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. There is a lot of theology in the goodness of who God is and, and the fact that he's good all the time. And so we reflect his character by seeking every opportunity to do good. There are lots of possible ways to do good. Uh, one of the very things, the goodest things I, c- I can do is to uh, baptize children. I love to do that. Uh, but there's also opportunity for you to do good. And I wanted to just show you one example of some good, uh, good things that Anna and Allie did this week. They baptized their rabbit. Here's the slideshow. <laughs> He doesn't want to get baptized. So what do you say? So the command of God is to go into go ye into the world and baptize you know all, and uh, I, I don't know if you had rabbits in mind, but why not do all the good you possibly can, right? Uh, when I was thinking about uh, doing all the good you can, and specifically what Art was telling me about, really focusing on the all, I, I, I was thinking about this passage in Ephesians that I've been sharing with you is one of the most often quoted verses of John Wesley, and it's Ephesians chapter two verses eight through ten. I invite you to to hear this passage. For by grace you have been saved through faith, 
And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us. Other versions say we are his handiwork, as it says on the screen. We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. We were created. So I just wanted to unpack that, that scripture for you. So it says, by, for by grace we have been saved through faith. And may, maybe we already get this, but I just want to make very certain that uh, what grace is. For by grace we have been saved. For me, I always like to think of grace as uh, God, oh, oh, do no harm. Uh, God's, God's activity towards us. So I don't know what you think rescues us from our rebellion, from our sinful nature. I don't know what you think might rescue us. You might think it's all the good things that you try to do so that, so that the end when judgment day happens, you fall on the good side and not the bad side. But the scripture says it's not that at all. For it's, it's God's activity towards us. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's, God, it's the fact that God is good all the time. Even when we are not. God is good all the time. And so, so in God and his all the time goodness extends his grace. And it's like his arm reaching out to us who are drowning. Now it does require something from us, doesn't it? We have to put our trust in that arm. We have to reach back for that arm. That's faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith. So is this awkward? Am I intimidating? I don't, but for by grace we have been saved through faith. So it does require something of us, but it, it always depends on God's action first. God's goodness all the time towards his people. God is totally and completely good all the time. For by grace we have been saved. But then the scripture goes on and says, why? So why is it that God would rescue us? Well, because his nature is good all the time, but he also has something in mind for us. That he wouldn't just save us from drowning. That he would restore us to whom he initially designed us to be. That he would restore us to how his intent was before the creation of the world. That he would restore us to be the kind of people that he had created us to be. Designed, the scripture says that he, that he would restore us to be what he has made us to be. His handiwork. His handiwork. The, I'm going to tell you a Greek word because I paid a lot of money to learn Greek. All right? Uh, and I don't know much of it. But the word for handiwork in this scripture passage from Ephesians 2 in, chapter, in verse 10, it says, For we are his poema. You know that word, poem. That's where we get the word poem from. We are his artwork. We are his artistry. We are his craft. His masterpiece. Some versions say we are his masterpiece. He, he has given us grace to rescue us and return us to this to the masterpiece that he's made us to be, and we were created. He, the artist has designed us for good works, for good works, which God prepared before, beforehand to be our way of life. He, he has designed us to be his instrument, his handiwork, his poetry, his ambassador, his representative to all the world. God's goal for us is that we would be like art, which displays the character of the one who made us. God's goal is that we would be his masterpiece, which says so much about the master who made us. Titus 2.14 says it like this, very similar. He it is who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people. God is working to purify himself, a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. God wants to make us a people who are zealous for good deeds. That's God's goal for us. Not just, not just, or maybe not only, to save us for the pie in the sky, heaven after, after death, but, but more importantly, more importantly, to save us for the here and now, to be a part of his good work and his good saving activity towards everyone else. The character of God is this, that God is good. Yeah. All the time. Absolutely, this is the reason that we are to be good. And we can be good. We can be good because God is good all the time. You know, God, God could have turned his back from us, but that is not the character of God. This is really important. That is not the character of God. God's character is good. And God's character is good all the time. 
all the time. I want to invite, take you on a little trip here. I hope it makes sense to you. But in Matthew chapter 6, you'll remember this is the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus is, is about to tell his disciples how to pray. Remember? He, he's given them instructions. And this is where we find the Lord's Prayer in the Gospel of Matthew. And he says this in Matthew 6 verse 7. He says, when you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. Some versions say the pagans do. For they think that, that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Now listen to what he says there. The disciples actually knew how to pray. You remember in Luke's version of the same, they, they come up to Jesus. They have to just put in words in the disciples' mouth, Luke does, and, and they come up to Jesus and say, Jesus, will you teach us how to pray? And, and so Jesus' response is not that the disciples don't, they know how to pray. The disciples probably pray better than you and I. They prayed, they were good, they were good Jewish boys, right? So they prayed in the morning, and they prayed at noontime, and they prayed in the evening. They prayed in the morning, they'd pray, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. In the noontime, they'd pray the Ten Commandments. I, the Lord, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And they, they knew how to pray, but Jesus says, here he says this, but this is, it's not that you don't know how to pray, but when you pray, make sure you don't pray like the pagans pray. It's really important. Jesus is drawing a contrast to how pagan people pray and how the disciples of Christ will pray. Now, how do pagan people pray? Well, if you remember in Jesus' day, they lived in the Roman Empire, and there's just a a myriad of Roman gods, the Parth Parthenon, right? A myriad of Roman gods. The Egyptians had a ton of gods also. There were gods everywhere. There was no shortage of gods. And the question was, the question was, how do you get what you need from God? Well, the way you get it is that you pray right. You've got to pray this little incantation. You've got to pray in this way. You gotta, if, if, if you can pray in some lofty way, maybe the God that you're praying to will hear you and, and you know, offer rain for your crops or, or offer healing to your sick son or whatever. But the important thing is, is that you, you pray in such a way that you might be able to manipulate the God that you're hoping to help you. And Jesus says, we don't, we don't pray like that. Do you know why we don't pray like that? Because that's not who our God is. You see, God is good all the time. That we cannot influence, we cannot influence the character of God or the activity of God because God stands outside creation. God is what, what, is, what is forever and unchanging. We call this word immutable. God is incontroversible. God is, you cannot alter God. God is the same Forever and ever, God, you, your prayers do not influence God in that way. Because God is good and all the time. So how you pray will not determine his activity. God's activity will always be good to you. This is the character of God, and it's forever. God is immutable. So what does this have to do with doing good? It has something. I'm getting there, okay? Wait. Matthew 5:43 just a little bit earlier than earlier in uh, that same uh, sermon on the mount Jesus says this You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy so he's getting at the component of being good here You've heard that it was said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy but I say to you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brother and sister, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So Jesus begins to talk about this immutable characteristic of God. He says, you have heard that it says, love, you know, love your neighbor but hate your enemy. But I say to you, love, love your, your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. And then uh, Ad Council will recognize this next verse because we've been talking about this. So that, right, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Now, what, so do you know that uh, my children are incredibly handsome and good looking? right? Because they resemble their parents, right? And this is the nature of children. We resemble our parents. And Jesus says the reason that you should do all the good you can is because in so doing, you'll, be, you'll actually be resembling, you'll be modeling a God who is good all the time. And just, he wants to reemphasize just how good God is 
all the time. And he says this. This is how good our God is all the time. For he makes his son. His son will rise on people who are despicable and on me. Or maybe I should have said, it will rise on me and people who are really good. Right? The sun will rise on the wicked. It will rise on the unjust. It will rise on that neighbor of yours who you just can't stand. The sun rises on that person. And it rises on you. Because God's goodness is unchanging towards everyone. Totally impartial. Totally impartial. Unbiased. You know? And he says this, not only that, but the rain. The rain will fall on, the, on, on those we just really love, you know? On nibbles the rabbit, the rain falls. But the rain also falls on that dog that bit you when you were five. Right? That God, why? Because God will love both of them equally. This is unfathomable. It's so abnormal. God's love is completely abnormal. It's not normal. We do not love in this way. And Jesus says, but God does. And you are his children. Or, you know, and so we reflect the character of the one who made us, right? And God's love is good all the time. And so Jesus gives us, you know, he says, you know, if you want to be good some of the time to the people that are very lovable, well, then you're just like everybody else. You're just like tax collectors and Gentiles. You're just like the ones who pray to all these different gods, right? Who, uh, who are kind of fickle about when, who they're going to love and when they're not going to love. You're just, you're resembling the character of that kind of God. But if you love all people, all the time, well, then you resemble your Father in heaven. Isn't that awesome? We can, we can resemble our Father in heaven. We can be perfect, as John Wesley would say, often quoted this scripture, be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. And what kind of perfection is he talking about? Perfect love. Can you imagine being perfect in that way? See, I know you all know how to be good, and that's why I didn't have a lot, long list of things of how to be good. I just wanted to, the hard thing, I think, is being good all the time to all people, to like everybody all the time. Doing good is normal. Doing good is completely normal. But doing God's kind of good is completely abnormal. To be good to all people all the time. You know, that's, uh, John Wesley had, had, had this. I I, do I have this slide up there? It says, do all the good you can. Yeah, let's read that together. Oh, no, the other one. Let's read it together. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. That's attributed to John Wesley. There's debate on whether or not he actually said it, but it gets the character, the content of what John Wesley would have us, have us know. But I, I, this is the way I, I would read that same thing for me. Do some of the good I can, by some of the means I can, in some of the ways I can, in some of the places I can, at some of the times I can, to some of the, of the people I can, as long as I sometimes can. But God's not like that. That's not the character of God. Thank goodness. Thank goodness that it's not the character of God. And the reason I know it's not the character of God is because God was good to me and did not turn his back on me when he had every right to do so. Thank goodness that God is good to the wicked and the righteous in the same manner, his, and he's good all the time. So think about the people uh, you don't want to do good to this week. <laughs> I mean, that's probably easier than the people we want to do good to. But think about the people you might not want to do good to, it's, or the people that it's really, really hard to do good to, or, or the people that you, who, who you don't notice that you could do good to, but you just don't notice them. People who aren't, there are people in my life who aren't good back. There are people who don't see eye to eye with me. It's really hard to do good to them. There are people who purposely hurt me. Really hard to do good to them. There are people who are just mean, and no matter what I do, it doesn't matter. They're, they, they don't like me, and they won't do good back to me. They won't be re receptive of my goodness. There are people, if we were to do good, there is probably nothing in it for us. 
I mean, like I would do good and I wouldn't like get anything back. Not, maybe not even the, the sense of goodness that I had from doing good, you know. And, and God is good to all of those people. Criminy. You know, that's so abnormal, God. You know, there's a, and, you, and I lived in Ukraine as a missionary for eight years, and there was this, this proverb or joke that, uh, not, it's not funny at all, but uh, my, uh, the lady we lived with, our host mama, Maria, she used to say this. She would say, uh, there's, there's a saying about Ukrainians, and that is, uh, you know, we're very, uh, that if a, uh, there's a, there's a story about how uh, a genie appears to Ukrainian and says, uh, I'll give you one wish. But whatever wish that you uh, wish, double will go to your neighbor. They'll get twice of it. And so the, a Ukrainian would say this, then take one of my eyes. I mean, this could be the character of us sometimes. I, I, she was talking about herself. I'm not saying Ukrainians, are, that's not my experience of all of Ukrainians. But, but the point is, that I think that sometimes we wish this. Take my one eye so my neighbor can't have any. But God is so completely opposite God, love, God is good. Thank you. He's like all the time good, just unwavering, just completely good to people even in our hearts that we would not like to be good to. You know, the love, the love that God's, the love of God is never ending. It's steadfast and merciful towards me. But the flip side of that is it's also never ending and steadfast towards everybody else. Because God is good all the time. All the time he's good. Wesley calls us to do good, you know, to the orphan, to the widow, the imprisoned, the poor. But not just the orphans and the widows and imprisoned that I like. You know? He like called, there are some of those people in that category that I really love to help. But Wesley calls us, and, the, and Jesus calls us, and the character of God is to be good to all of them equally, no matter who they are. So this, last week I asked you to focus on doing no harm, and I, and I, but while you were focusing on doing no harm, I focused on doing good, okay? And I tried to remember to also to do no harm. But, uh, uh, so I'd like to just tell you a little bit of what I learned about doing good this last week. First, uh, is I found out this, that it's really important if you want to do good, uh, that you have to, like, have a heightened alertness toward the possibility of doing good. Because there's real, if you're going to do good all the time, you really need to be sensitive to the fact that there are always opportunities to do good. Because I think, I think if you're like me, you drive the same route to, you know, to Walmart and to Cub Food and the same route to the Red Box and the same route. You know, and there's, there's nothing from my path that, seems, that wavers too much. And so, uh, so things begin to blend, things and people begin to sort of blend into the woodwork, and you lose sight of the opportunity to do good just about at any moment. And so when you have the heightened sense, when you have the heightened desire to do good, to pay attention, you really find out, wow, the possibilities of doing good are inexhaustible. You know, when we, when we live in a town in a long time, we begin to see nothing uh, and assume everything. But when you were new to town, I got a friend who just started coming, uh, just moved to Mankato. And man, this guy is seeing everything and assuming nothing. And I think God asks us to put those kind of eyes on. You know, you find in the scripture with the disciples continually encountering people, encountering people and seeing the opportunity to do good. I think it's just the, the spirit is working in them where they're just completely alert and sensitive to, the, to what God is placing in their path. The opportunities for good, good are limitless if we'll just look. The other thing I learned this week is this, that the opposite of doing good is not doing bad. The opposite of doing good is doing nothing. And I think that's where I, probably I really, I really struggle the most is it's not that I, I, I would do anything intentionally bad, but, but when, I see, when, I see thing, when I see opportunities for good, I, I don't engage in them. I just sort of you know, I'm, I'm lazy or I don't want to be inconvenienced or, and so I do nothing at all. But that's the same, that's sort of the opposite of love. The opposite of love you may have heard is not hatred but indifference. There's a general malaise that can come over us. Be unconcerned. You know, we, a Christian never says, who cares? Because we know that God cares. And so we also care. We care. Third thing I wanted to tell you about is, as you guys know what an anxious person I am, 
And so I really found my own anxiety leaking into my ability to do good. Do you guys remember Pastor Jim Cresilius here at this church? And uh, he, I was, I'm told, I didn't, uh, Jim's an amazing preacher, but I was told that on Saturdays he couldn't eat a thing. And that uh, he, he might even vomit, you know, on Saturday night because he's all worried about Sunday. This is the life of preachers, man. I, I eat plenty on Saturday, but I, there is always this constant anxiety. And this week, with that anxiety of having this, this presentation due here on Sunday, you know, there's also, I, I'm in this class now, and so I had some, I had some papers due uh, last week. I just finished one only to find out there's another one due. And I was just, I'm just like, oh, I'm like this, and I'm stressed, and I'm anxiety. And then, and then, my, then I start to eat poorly, right? You know, or then I, I start to sleep maybe too much, or, or I engage in all these procrastination techniques that, that end, uh, only me, right? And it ends in like a downward negative thought process. That my anxiety can get me thinking that I'm just worthless, and that I'm never going to get any of this done, and, and I'll waste most of my time just complaining to you rather than actually reading the book I'm supposed to read. Or, and, and it just goes down and down and down and down and down. But I found that... I found that when I could set that aside for a moment and instead seek an opportunity to do good outside myself. Because you know, when you get in that downward spiral, you're such a narcissist. You're so self-focused. But I found that when I would stick to Wesley's rule, you know, to do all the good I can, that when I'd find opportunities to do good, I would actually get freed up. My love, my, my, the weight would be lessened. And I think it's because of this. It wasn't that it had more time to do the work. But I think it's because I began to understand that there's something more important than Fred in this world. <laughs> it's hard to grasp right now. And uh, I, th I, th I think I began to understand that maybe my identity doesn't come in how well I do this on Sunday morning. Maybe it freed me up to recognize that in doing good, I began to recognize that my identity is in Christ. And I'm God's child right now in this moment because he created me beforehand to do this very thing. And I began to feel the purpose, the real purpose that God has given me. And to understand myself as a child of God. So those of you who struggle with anxiety, this is your way out. To do good. Do all the good you can. Finally, I want to say this, that doing good is nothing about the actual result. This week I tried to teach someone to drive a stick shift. I should be the last person doing that. And the results were very poor. But the intention of the heart is what God, God grades us on. You know, it has nothing to do with the actual performance. It has to do with the intention of the heart. And my intention was to teach this person to drive really well. Right? And so, so I just I offer those up to you. Finally, I just want to say, so when you encounter that person, when I ask you to think about people who are just really, really hard to be good to, when you encounter that person, I want you to think of some, I want you to thank God this week for that person. Like when you, in that, in that conflicted moment, you're like, how am, I, how am I possibly going to do good to this person who never responds to my goodness? I don't want to do good to this person. They're different than me, or, or I'm different than them. I don't want to. When you, when you encounter that person, I want you to thank God. You know why? Because in that moment, you finally get a chance to, to reflect the character of God, who would be good to that person. Otherwise, you're only reflecting the character of tax collectors and pagans. But in that moment, you finally, you finally get the chance to really exercise your faith to do good in a way God does good. And God is good all the time. Amen. Jesus, we are so thankful for your unending goodness towards us. Your grace that we did not deserve. And we want to be called your children. We recognize that you saved us for that, to be children that reflect the image of your Father in this world. So bring your, for your Holy Spirit into us this week as we seek to do all the possible good we can. And in so doing, it's our hope that our Father in heaven is glorified. Amen.